Thank you, Anand. Well, I'm very pleased and humbled at the same time to pay tribute to Euler's genius and to his incredibly voluminous and diverse work. Clearly, to do full justice to Euler would take considerably longer than one hour. How about a week? So all I can do is try to provide you with a glimpse of Euler's life, <coughs> a hint of his many contributions, and a brief portrayal of Euler the man. <coughs> Euler's life actually is rather straightforward. There are three stations in his life. The first one is Basel, the years of his youth. <coughs> then uh, about 15 years in St. Petersburg, 25 years in Berlin, and the rest of his life, again 15 years or so, back in St. Petersburg. For each of these time, <coughs> time periods, I will give a brief chronological record of events, identify the major works, and discuss a few selected results of Euler in some more detail. All right, here is the first station of his life. Basel. And I call this period the period of auspicious beginnings. First, some chronology. He was born, he was born April 15, 1707, the first of four children. His parents were Paulus Euler, a Protestant minister, and Margareta Brucker. Paulus Euler came from a modest, from modest folks, mostly artisans, while Margareta Brucker was a descendant of an impressive line of distinguished scholars of the classics. Euler spent his early childhood at the parish residence in Rien, a suburb of Basel. And you see on the left the residence as it looks today. But 300 years ago it was much smaller and the quarters it provided were very cramped. <coughs> on the right you see the church in Rien where Euler was a minister. It's the same church, if I may say so, in which my wife Erika and I got married by one of the many successors of Paulus Euler, <laughs> <laughs> who happened to be a school friend of us. So that's my connection to Euler. <clears throat> At the age of eight, Euler was sent to the Latin school in Basel, where he boarded at his grandmother's house. He attended the University of Basel from 1720 to 1726. Notice 1720 was 13 years old, but that was normal at the time because the first couple of years at the university were preparatory. They were not the real advanced uh, university level courses as we know it today. <coughs> you see the old University of Basel, the yellowish building across the Rhine River on the left picture. <coughs> and on the right you see Johann Bernoulli the younger of the two most famous Bernoulli brothers. Why do I show him? <clears throat> well, 
he is the one who discovered Euler and who became his teacher and mentor. Euler has taken several of Bernoulli's courses and performed so exceptionally well that he caught Bernoulli's attention. Bernoulli took Euler under his wings and started to literally coach him. He gave Euler a bunch of very difficult math books to study and offered him free access to his house every Saturday afternoon to discuss questions or objections that Euler may have encountered. As Euler recalls in his brief autobiography of 1767, and I quote, Johann Bernoulli was gracious enough to comment on my collected difficulties which was done with such a desired advantage that when he resolved one of my objections, 10 others at once disappeared, which certainly is the best method of making auspicious progress in the mathematical sciences." End of quote. And I'm sure we all agree on that. The Saturday afternoon sessions with Johann Bernoulli have become known and famous as the Privatissima. It was during this Privatissima that Bernoulli more and more began to admire the extraordinary mathematical talents of the young Euler. In fact, he came to see in Euler his own reincarnation. In 1726, remember, 19 years old, he participates in the prize question of the Paris Academy with a memoir on the optimal placing of masts on a ship. Euler, who so far in his life has never as much as seen a ship, he did not win first prize, but a respectable second. In 1727, 20 years old, he applied for the physics chair at the University of Basel with a work on the theory of sound that you see on the left screen. This is what today we will call a thesis of habilitation. He failed and didn't even make it to the finalists. Obviously, he was considered to be much too young for a professorship at the university, and his publication record at that time was rather thin. In a way, this failure was really a blessing in disguise, since he was now free to accept a call from the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences. Thus, he left Basel for good in April of 1727 to assume a junior appointment at the Academy of St. Petersburg. Thus, we come to the second station of Euler's life, St. Petersburg. I call it a period of meteoric rise to world fame and academic advancement. You see on the left the Academy of St. Petersburg as it looks today, and on the, ra on the right uh, Peter the Great, Peter the First, who as you may know founded the city of St. Petersburg and was very instrumental in setting up the Academy of St. Petersburg. He died before the Academy uh, could open. As I said, first some chronology. The groundwork for Euler's appointment at the Academy had been laid by Johann Bernoulli, 
who actually was also invited to become a member of the Academy, but he declined. And by his sons, Nicholas II and Daniel I, both already active at the Academy. In 1731, he was made a professor of physics at the Academy and became, at the same time, an ordinary member of the Academy. 1733, he succeeds Daniel Bernoulli, who returns to Basel as professor of mathematics. The year thereafter, he married Katharina Xell, a marriage that brought forth 13 children, of whom, however, only five reached the age of adulthood. In 1735, he suffered the first setback in health, a uh, vicious, uh, infectious disease causing a high fever, and Euler almost lost his life. To the relief of everybody in St. Petersburg and in Basel, in fact, to the relief of everybody in the whole world, Euler recovered completely and could resume his busy schedule. Three years later, however, in 1378, he was hit again, probably by the same infectious disease, but this time he lost his right eye. From this time on, he was one-eyed. One, one eye, he was blind. In 1741, he left St. Petersburg following political unrest after the death of the Empress Anna Ivanovna, a niece of Peter I, and accepted an invitation of Frederick II to help set up an academy in Berlin. Okay, here are the major treatises completed during this first St. Petersburg period. Now, when I say treatises, I mean major works of typically 400 to 600 pages, sometimes even more, in large quarto volumes. The first major work was his Mechanica, the analytic theory of motion, in which he deals essentially with the mechanics of a mass point, kinematics and dynamics of a mass point, in free motion in volume one, and in constrained motion in volume two, constrained that is by a surface in a three-dimensional space. What makes this work important is that mechanics, for the first time, is treated by a systematic use of differential and integral calculus, fairly new at that time, including differential equations. In this sense, it is the first treatise of what is now called analytic or rational mechanics. In the first volume, incidentally, Euler outlines a grandiose program of treating all aspects of mechanics. The mechanics of a of rigid body, of a flexible and elastic body, fluid mechanics, celestial mechanics, and all the rest. The Mechanica here is just the beginning of this ambitious program. The next work on an entirely different uh, topic, music. Since childhood, Euler was very interested in music and composition. I don't know whether he has composed anything. And he had plans to write a volume on music theory already when he was in Basel. The plan matured in St. Petersburg and gave rise to his music theory, the Tentamen Nove Theorie Musicae, an attempt of a new theory of music. Apart from introductory chapters on the nature of sound as a vibration of air particles and of generation of sound, by string and wind instruments, 
and the auditory perception of sound by the human ear, the core of the work deals with the mathematical theory of pleasantness of musical constructs, that is, musical elements like a tone interval, a chord, or a succession of such. The work concludes with a detailed mathematical theory of temperaments, musical temperaments, both antique and contemporary ones, in particular Euler's favorite diatonic chromatic temperament. The third major treatise during this period is his naval, oh, I forgot. This is the mechanics, two volumes. This is the music theory, and the third treatise called Naval Science, uh, written already in 1740 and 41, but appeared in 49. This is the second milestone in the development of rational mechanics. It clearly sets out the principle of hydrostatics and then deals with the stability theory, that is, with the theory of equilibrium of three-dimensional bodies submerged in water, and with what is very new and original at the time, a theory of the oscillations about the state of equilibrium, pitching and tossing of a ship. The second volume applies the theory to naval engineering and navigation, that is, to shipbuilding and the effect of sails, rudder, etc., on the motion of the ship. Okay, as promised, I show you a few examples of Euler's work, some jewels out of his mathematical workshop. The first one, of course, is the parcel problem. This is the name that has become attached to the problem of determining the sum of the reciprocal squares. That is, 1 plus 1 over 2 squares plus 1 over 3 squares, and so on. The problem has stumped the leading mathematicians of the time. Leibniz in Germany, Stirling in England, de Moivre in France, and all of the Bernoullis, even Johann, who had popularized the problem, could not do it until Euler came along. Typically for Euler, he started out computing the series to seven decimals, using his stupendous capabilities of mental calculation and his adroitness in speeding up slowly converging series. It was in connection with the Basel problem, incidentally, that Euler in 1732 discovered a general summation formula where he doesn't sum the reciprocal powers of two, but any function, f of one plus f of two plus f of three and so on, where f is any function, but it's an asymptotic series now known as the euler maclaurin formula, since Maclaurin rediscovered it six years later. Euler used it promptly to calculate the Basel series to 20 decimal places. The breakthrough came in 1735, published in 1740, when he showed by a brilliant but daring procedure using Newton's identities for polynomials of infinite degree, for example, that the sum is pi squared over 6. That was sensational and made Euler world famous overnight. The result can be written in terms of the zeta function. Zeta of s shown here, where you use the s power rather than the second power. And Euler's result can be stated as zeta of 2 equal pi squared over 6. 
spectacular as this achievement was. Euler went on and determined z of 4, z of 6, up to z of 12 by the same procedure, which however this time became a lot more complicated and laborious. He found that each time the answer is a rational number multiplied by an appropriate power of pi. The fourth power for z of 4, sixth power for z of 6, and so on. Later, in 1750, he was able to prove rigorously this time, using his own infinite product of the sine function, for example, that zeta of any even number, 2n, is indeed the 2nth power of pi times a rational number, which is here explicitly identified in terms of b sub 2n, which are the Bernoulli numbers that Jacob Bernoulli, the older brother of Johann, introduced in his Ars Conjectanti, and which Euler already encountered in his general summation formula. Euler also tried odd values of the argument. He computed z of 3, z of 5, etc. But he wrote in a letter to his teacher, Johann Bernoulli, that, and I quote, the odd powers I cannot sum, and I don't believe that their sums depend on the quadrature of the circle, that is, on pi." End of quote. As a matter of fact, the problem in this case is still open today. Second example. And I show you on the left, Euler, how he looked about this time of his life, with both eyes still intact, incidentally. The second example deals with prime numbers and the zeta function. So <coughs> let script P be the set of all prime numbers. 2, 3, 5, 7, etc., all the integers that have as devices only one and themselves. Then Euler proved the fabulous formula written in red here. If you take any prime p and form 1 over 1 minus 1 divided by p to the power s and multiply together all these results, what you get is precisely z of s. Remember z of s is the sum of all the reciprocal powers, s powers of the integers. How did he do it? Well, he starts from z of s. He starts from the right side. And he peels away all terms divisible by 2. I mean, all terms whose denominator integers are divisible by 2. And he does that by dividing z of s by 2 to the s, and then subtracting the result from z of s. That way, he gets that series, and all the terms divisible by 2 are gone. Then he takes the next prime number 3 and does the same for 3. Okay, Eliminates all those terms that, that are divisible by 3. Then he takes 5 and goes through all the prime numbers, eliminates all those terms that are divisible by this prime number. Well, every integer is a product of prime numbers, and so eventually he eliminates all the terms. And what is left? What is left is just one. The one always stays. Okay. And so he has this formula here, where that product over the prime numbers are just these peeling operations that I mentioned for p equal 2. 3, 5, etc. 
But this formula is the same as the one he wants to prove. You just have to divide by this product and you get the original formula. A very nice example of Euler's genius, I think. Because the result is quite surprising because it connects prime numbers with an analytic function. And it also provides, incidentally, a neat an analytic proof of the fact already shown known to the Greeks, that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Indeed, it is known that zeta of 1, that is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, etc., is infinite. That was already known in the 14th century, or even before. It's the harmonic series. That is infinite. So if you put s equal 1 in the red formula above, on the right, you have infinite. Therefore, on the left, you cannot have a product consisting only of a finite number of terms, because otherwise it would be finite. So there must be infinitely many primes. The formula really is the beginning of what is known today as analytic number theory. And it paved the way to important later developments in the distribution of primes. OK, next period, Berlin. <clears throat> I call this the period of emergence of e epochal treatises. You see on the left the Academy of Berlin, an old drawing. And on the right, Frederick II, who you recall invited Euler to set up the Academy in 1741. Some chronology. Frederick II took his time in setting up the Academy, since he was deeply involved in war, in war campaigns in Silesia. It was not until 1746 that the Berlin Academy opens its doors with Maupertuis, its president, and Euler, the director of the mathematics class. In the intervening five years, Euler, of course, did not remain idle. He completed some 20 memoirs, five major treatises, and he composed over 200 letters, some quite extensive. At, in the same year, he was elected a foreign member of the Royal Society of London, one of the major academies at that time in Europe. Quite an honor. In, 19, in sorry, 1750, Euler's widowed mother joins him in Berlin where she lives in Euler's country estate together with Euler's sister-in-law and his children. 1752, Maupertuis returns to Paris in disgrace. And I can go into the scandals that he got involved in since I don't have the time to do so. But anyway, Euler incidentally was somewhat involved too in that scandal. <laughs> But he didn't take it that seriously. So Euler had to take over the academy, if not as de facto, then as the jury president. In 1755, he was elected foreign member of the Paris Academy, even a higher honor because Normally, the number of foreign members of the Paris Academy is limited to eight. They made a rare exception for Euler since there was no vacancy at that time. So he was elected the ninth foreign member, quite exceptionally. From 1763 on, Euler's relationship with Frederick II 
began to sour. And I can't explain all the details why. At any rate, by 1766, Euler had enough, and he returned to St. Petersburg, where he had an invitation from the Empress Catherine II, who was reigning at that time, to rejoin the academy. And in fact, he was given a absolutely triumphant welcome home in St. Petersburg. Some major treatises. Now, as I said, actually there are 10 of them that he completed in the Berlin period. The first is the Methodus Invenienti Lineas Corpus, one of Euler's masterpieces, the first exposition ever of the calculus of variations. So this deals with the problem of optimization. One seeks a curve, a linear curva, or what is the same, a function that minimizes a certain analytic expression, typically an integral expression that depends on the function. Before Euler, problems of this type were considered only for very special cases. The best known being the Parkistochron problem, that is, to find a curve between two points in a vertical plane along which a mass point moves in the shortest amount of time. Euler vastly generalizes this problem, thereby creating an entirely new branch of mathematics called, already by Euler, the calculus of variations. The centerpiece of this theory is Euler's differential equation, a necessary condition that any solution of the problem must satisfy. Typically for Euler, he includes numerous examples for mathematics and the natural sciences, some hundred of them, including, for example, the principle of least action. The two smaller works that followed, uh, the trajectory, one on the trajectory of comets and planets, and the second one on optics, on the theory of light and color. This second work is of some historical importance since it started the debate of Newton's particle theory of light versus Euler's own wave theory. The next treatise is called Artillery. A catchy title, isn't it? Actually, it's a work on ballistics, exterior as well as interior ballistics, especially the latter, which was new at the time. It is a vastly expanded and annotated German translation of Robin's New Principles of Gunnery. It was a work undertaken to please Euler's master, King Frederick II. Actually, it is a splendid example of Euler's magnanimity. Robbins had been unfairly and rudely critical of Euler's Mechanica of 1736, which Euler simply ignored at the time. Now he recognizes the importance and originality of Robin's work and promptly translates it into German with greetings to Frederick II, but makes it about five times as large as the original by adding and sometimes correcting much to what Robbins had written. Niklaus Fuß, who during the last 10 years of Euler's life was one of his assistants, incidentally also from Basel. Niklas Fuss writes in his eulogy of Euler, and I quote, the only revenge Euler took against his adversary because of the old injustice consists in having made Robbins work so famous as Without him, it would never have become. Mm -hmm. 
Now we come to the splendid work on calculus, probably Euler's most famous work. The introduction to analysis of the infinite, the differential calculus, and the integral calculus. A magnificent trilogy, as Fellman has called it, one of the biographers, or in fact the only biographer of Euler. It establishes analysis as we know it today. The next treatise crowns Euler's work on mechanics. This is the Theoria Motus Corporum, also called the second mechanics, mechanics of rigid bodies. This is the third milestone in Euler's development of mechanics. It deals with the extremely difficult problem of describing the motion of a rigid body subject to external forces. The way Euler solves the problem is by employing two coordinate systems, one fixed, the other moving, attached to the body. The important quantities then are the angles between the respective coordinate axes, now called Euler angles, for which he derives differential equations, celebrated Euler equations of motion. Throughout his life, Euler, on and off, dealt with problems of geometric optics. His Dioptrics is a huge three-volume work, largely motivated by the chromatic and spherical aberration in optical instruments and ways to eliminate them. Finally comes the bestseller of Euler his letters to a German princess, where he laid out his philosophical views on science, religion, and ethics. Who was this princess? Well, she was an 18-year-old lady, a cousin of second degree of Frederick II. These letters, 234 of them, are written in such a clear style, accessible also to people not trained in the sciences, that they became an instant success and were translated into all the major languages. Okay, some more uh, jewels out of Euler's mathematical workshop. The Königsberg bridge problem. Ah, I forgot all these volumes. Here are the letters. And here is the city, the Prussian city of Königsberg, with the Pregel River flowing through it, dividing the land area into an island and three distinct land masses, one to the north, one to the east, and one to the south. There are seven bridges as, located, as shown in green. And the problem is, can you take a stroll from one point in the city to another, maybe to the point of departure, in such a way that each of the seven bridges is crossed exactly once. Not more than once, not less than once, but exactly once. Well, no matter how you try, you won't succeed. Indeed, Euler put an end to the guessing game by proving that such a path does not exist. What is important here is not so much the result, but the method he used to prove it. In fact, he settled not only this particular problem, but a host family of other similar problems. He does this by a clever process of abstraction. He associates with each landmass a vertex in the plane, a point, and with each bridge an edge connecting two points. So he arrives what today is called 
a connected graph. And here I show you the connected graph that belongs to the Königsberg problem. The four points in red are the land masses, the north, the island, south and east. And the edges connecting these points represent bridges. And you can check that it's correct. So in abstract terms, we are thus looking for a path or a circuit. A circuit is a closed path through the graph which traverses each edge exactly once. So here we have a connected graph, we have paths and circuits, and we have Eulerian paths and circuits which are the ones we seek, namely in which each edge is uh, traversed exactly once. Euler recognizes that the crucial concept here is the degree of a vertex. What's the degree? Well, it's simply the number of edges emanating from, from it. So, the degree is there, the top vertex has degree 3, the one below it has degree 5, the bottom one degree 3, and the one on the right has degree 3 also. So the degree here, the degrees are th all 3 except for one a vertex where the degree is 5. What Euler proves <coughs> is the following. And please notice that holds for any connected graph, not just for the Koenigsberg graph, any connected graph, no matter how complicated. So he, he proves the following. Let n be the number of vertices of odd degree. Over there it's 4. n is 4. A. If n is zero, that is, there is none, there is no such uh, vertex, the graph has at least one Eulerian circuit. And Euler, in fact, shows exactly how to find it. B, if n is two, it has at least one Eulerian path, but no circuit. And again, Euler shows you how to find it. And C, if n is larger than 2, it has neither. n equal 1 is impossible, as you can check. So, in the Königsberg bridge problem, in particular, we know n is 4. So we are in case C, larger than 2, so it has neither a Eulerian path nor a Eulerian circuit. And end of story. Or is it? Actually, it's the beginning of a long story still in the process of being played out. It's the beginning of two new branches of mathematics, graph theory and topological circuits, both still very much alive today. Let's move on to oil flow. Here I show oil as he looks about this time, this point in his life. 1750, 51 or 53. Okay, there are three famous memoirs, all published in 1757 that is 250 years ago, in which Euler develops fluid mechanics as we know it today, making pressure a fundamental concept of continuum mechanics. The basic principles of fluid mechanics, the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, give rise to the celebrated Euler equations, a system of nonlinear hyperbolic partial differential equations, which have to be solved given appropriate initial and boundary conditions. In Euler's time, this was virtually impossible to do, except in very special cases. Today, however, these equations are routinely being used in computer simulation of flows. 
Here is an example. Uh, calculated by Nicola Botta in 1995 of a transonic oil of flow about the cylinder. The flow is from left to right, showing the vorticity contour lines. Very complicated flow and unfortunately I don't have the movie ready to actually show you how this flow evolves. It's just a, a uh, instant time, time exposure. The next example is Euler's polyhedral formula. A polyhedron is a solid body bounded by planar faces. It need not be regular. It is said to be convex if for any two points in the body, the lesser straight line connecting them is also entirely contained in the body. Now in a three-dimensional convex polyhedron, let V be the number of vertices, E the number of edges, and F the number of faces. So, case of the octahedron shown on the left, we have V equals 6 vertices, 4 in the center, 1 on top, 1 at the bottom. We have edges E equal 12, 4 on top, 4 on bottom, and 4 around the center. And we have F equal 8, 8 faces. Now Euler proves the stunning formula that V minus E plus F is always equal to 2. No matter what polyhedron you consider, as long as it is convex. And basically he proves this by chopping away from the given polyhedron pieces after piece after piece in such a way that V minus E plus F remains constant. And once he comes down to tetrahedron, he can count these numbers and it turns out to be two, so it's two for every polyhedron. That's basically how he proves it. Okay. I told this formula recently at dinner to one of our grandchildren, 11 year old. He understood immediately what's going on. He checked some other cases like the cube and finally he explained, he said, hey, that's cool. And cool indeed it is. Okay, let's proceed to the Saint, second St. Petersburg time, the glorious final stretch. And start again with some chronology. 1771, Euler loses his good left eye following a cataract operation and becomes virtually blind. Now, misfortunes usually don't come alone, they come in pairs. And indeed, soon after he became blind, Euler's wooden house burns down during the great St. Petersburg fire. Had it not been for a heroic rescue by a workman from Basel, the blind Euler would have burned alive. Now the house was replaced by the em Empress uh, Saint, uh, Catherine II by a modern structure in brick as you see it on the left. Seventeen thirty seventy-three, Euler's wife Catherine dies. 
He remarries three years later, in fact, the stepsister of his first wife. And in 1783, on September 18, Euler dies of a stroke while playing with one of his grandchildren. What are the major treatises? There are three of them I like to mention that were completed during the second St. Petersburg period. The first is the algebra. This is a work written for the absolute beginner. It's a prime example of Euler's extraordinary didactic skill. It becomes another bestseller, translated in all major languages. Euler dictated the work to a young man he brought with him from Berlin, a tailor by profession, who, according to the introduction to the work, and I quote, who was fairly good at computing, but beyond that, did not have the slightest notion about mathematics. As far as his intellect goes, he belonged among the mediocre minds." End of quote. Nevertheless, when the work was completed, this young man understood everything perfectly well, and he was able to solve algebraic problems posed to him with great ease. Tribute to Oil, a magnificent teacher, obviously. The second lunar theory was a monumental work explaining the many irregularities of the moon's orbit, in which Euler struggles with solving the three-body problem. That is the problem of the motion of three bodies under the forces of mutual uh, gravitation. In this case, the bodies are the sun, the earth, and the moon. Newton already is reputed to have said that, and I quote, an exact solution of the three-body problem exceeds, if I'm not mistaken, the power of any human mind." End of quote. Today we know that an exact solution is impossible. Even for Euler, in one of his memoirs, a prize-winning one at that, claimed that he found an exact solution. But here in this work he did approximate solutions to the three-body problem. And then comes the second, so-called second theory of ships on construction and maneuvering of ships. And this was written for people like sailors with no or little mathematical knowledge. The French maritime and finance minister, Jacques Turgot, also a famous economist, proposed to the king, to King Louis XVI, that all students in marine schools in France are to be required to study Euler's theory of ships. The king even paid Euler 1,000 rubles for the privilege of having the work reprinted. And the Empress Catherine II, not wanting to be outdone by the king, doubled the amount and pitched in an additional 2,000 rubles. Some more selections. First, so-called oil disk. This is really an example of the motion of a rigid body, a circular disk twirling on a flat, smooth surface. In addition to gravitational forces, Euler here also considers forces due to friction. Paradoxically, the speed of the motion seems to increase even though energy is being dissipated through friction. The disk eventually comes to an abrupt halt flat on the surface. Let's watch it. See it? You see how this seems to speed up. And in fact, if you hear it, the sound, the pitch of the sound increases steadily 
up to a certain amount. Okay, and now all of a sudden the disk stops. You can imagine that to describe this mathematically is quite difficult, but Euler did it. Next example is an example from industry. Euler had many responsibilities at the academy, not just to do research, but also to consult on a variety of engineering and uh, um, technological pro and pro uh, 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 projects. And it was in connection with designing water turbines that Euler developed optimal profiles for teeth in cogwheels that transmit motion with a minimum amount of resistance and noise. These profiles involve segments of so-called cycloidal curves, like shown here on the left. The technical realization of this design took shape only later in what is called the involute gear. Euler not only is the inventor of this kind of gear, but he also anticipated the underlying geometric equations, now usually called the euler savary equations. Let's see the gear in action. You see? Again. You don't hear anything, no noise whatsoever. <laughs> okay. Do we still have about five or seven minutes? Okay. I want to say a few words about Euler the Man. From all accounts of contemporaries of Euler, he was a modest, inconspicuous, uncomplicated man, yet cheerful and sociable. In the words of Fuchs, Niklaus Fuchs again, honesty, uncompromising rectitude, the acknowledged national virtues of Swiss people, <laughs> I'm happy to say, he possessed to a superior degree. Euler never disavowed, in fact was proud of his Swiss heritage. According to Fuchs, who also originates from Basel, he, and I quote, always retained the Basel dialect with all the peculiarities of its idiom. Often he amused himself to recall for me certain provincialisms and reversals in word orders, or mix into his speech Basel expressions whose use and meaning I had long forgotten." End of quote. Oops. He was entirely free of priority concerns. Feelings of rancor, be it because of priority issues, or because of unfair criticism are totally foreign to Euler. He was generous in acknowledging and furthering other people's work. A case in point is the way he put on hold his already extensive work on hydrodynamics, so that his friend Daniel Bernoulli, who was working on the same topic, could complete and publish his own hydrodynamics first. In fact, it became a classic. Intellect, he had a phenomenal memory and was extremely well read. The story is well known that Euler, even at an advanced age, could recite by heart all the verses 
of Virgil's Aeneid. I don't know how many thousand verses. He had an unusual power of mental calculation, as I already uh, mentioned. It is said that during a sleepless night, Euler mentally calculated the first six powers of all the numbers less than 20. Several days later, he was still able to recall all the answers without hesitation. And he had the ability to concentrate on mental work under adverse conditions, regardless of any hustle and bustle going on around him he was able to do his mental work. A child on the knees, a cat on his back, that's how he wrote his immortal works, is what Thiebold wrote about him. Craftsmanship, well, he was a superb expositor. His goal was ultimate clarity and simplicity. And he often revisited earlier work when he felt they were lacking these qualities. Yet when it came to discoveries, he could be fearless, aggressive, even reckless. But aided by a sure instinct, he rarely went astray when his argumentation became shaky. Now in closing, let me cite the text concise but to the point that Professor Otto Spies in Basel had inscribed on a memorial plaque attached next to the house in which Euler grew up. Oh, here is Euler. Leonhard Euler, 1707 to 1783, mathematician, physicist, engineer, astronomer, and philosopher, spent his youth in Rien. He was a great scholar and a kind man. Thank you. I'm personally curious about exactly what this craze, uh, what, what led to uh, Euler leaving Berlin and, and going back to St. Petersburg. Well, he, it was the king, Frederick II, who uh, treated Euler very shabbily. He denied him all kinds of requests. And he never, that's the, perhaps the most important reason, he never offered him the presidency of the academy, even though, in fact, he was president. In fact, he invited D'Alembert from Paris to be president. He came to Berlin, told the king that he is not interested, and recommended Euler instead, <laughs> which the king promptly ignored. <laughs> OK, things like that. Things like that. Any other comments, please? I think we should thank Perhaps you. I should say that I also ha have a written version of the talk, which is much more detailed and has more examples. Anybody interested, I'd be happy to send a copy. Thanks again.